question and discussing what we called the 5% rule. When we consider writing out ionization of acids, we've always discussed so far in our journey what were called monoprotic acids, those acids that have a single proton contributing to their acidity. There are also polyprotic, poly meaning many, many protons, but they always, always will dissociate in a stepwise fashion. Polyprotic acids dissociate in a stepwise fashion. A polyprotic acid, for example, phosphoric acid, H3PO4, it's called a triprotic acid. Sulfuric acid, is a polyprotic acid. It contains two acidic hydrogens, also known as a diprotic acid. Carbonic acid would be a diprotic acid. Each one of those protons comes off in a stepwise fashion. So remember in Bronsted-Lowry theory when we're considering um, conjugate pairs, they only differ by a single hydrogen ion. So we'll move them in a stepwise fashion. We'll notice that the Ka for the first step is always a much larger number than the Ka for the second, which is a larger number than the Ka for the third. We denote those as Ka1, Ka2, and if there is a Ka3, nothing larger than a triprotic acid. So looking at the magnitude of our values, Ka1 indicate, because they're much larger, it's easier to remove the first proton from a polyprotic acid than to remove the second, and the second is easier to remove than the third. And the Ka values will show a much successively smaller number. ready. When we look at an example of a Ka, here's arsenic acid. It's a triprotic acid. It has three values of Ka. Removal of the first proton, 5.6 times 10 to the negative third. To remove the second proton, 1 times 10 to the negative 7. And finally to remove the third proton, 3 times 10 to the negative 12. Notice the magnitude of the Ka constants gets significantly smaller. It is much easier to remove the first proton and increasingly becomes more difficult to take off the second and more and more difficult to release the third proton. Acids become increasingly weaker with their successful removal of their protons. So polyprotic acids always dissociate in a stepwise fashion. Polyprotic acids will act as a base in the first step and an acid in the second step. In a stepwise fashion, the base in the first step then becomes its acid in the second step and that makes sense again according to the Bronsted-Lowry theory. As long as we have a Ka value that's differ by a factor of a 10 cubed or a thousand uh, three zeros there, it's possible to obtain a satisfactory estimate of the pH by considering only Ka1. I'm going to repeat that. I'm going to even highlight it. Even though a polyprotic acid has multiple ionizations, if the difference between Ka1 and Ka2 is a factor of 10 to the third power or more, I may determine the pH by only ionizing the first hydrogen. Arsenic acid, 10 to the negative third, Ka1 value. Ka2, 1 times 10 to the negative seventh value. Ka2 is so significantly smaller than the Ka1, its contribution to the pH of our system is negligible. That when I'm asked to calculate a pH of a polyprotic acid, I only need to remove the first hydrogen to find the pH. I do not remove the second hydrogen, hydrogen as its contribution to the system is insignificant. And certainly, the third hydrogen removal here is so insignificant, 
it would not contribute to a swing in the pH of a solution. When we are asked to calculate a pH of a polyprotic solution, we only take off the first hydrogen to find the pH. If we have a polyprotic acid, let's just make one up, H2X. H2X is a polyprotic acid. It dissociates, releasing a single hydrogen and leaving me whoops, a hydrogen X negative or HA giving us H plus and HA negative, whatever language there for the symbols. But we have a little conjugate pair setting up over here. H2X releases a first hydrogen quite readily. HX negative is also produced. Now remember, if this is the acid, this is its conjugate base. In the first ionization step, the first ionization, we produce a base. This base then in the next progression ionizes a little bit more to produce a conjugate pair as well. The base in the first step becomes the acid in the second step, but its ionization is so small producing very few hydrogen ions, it's not worth measuring in terms of contribution to a pH. When we're asked to calculate the pH of a polyprotic system, the first ionization, that concentration of the first hydrogen ion, will allow us to calculate pH. Let's look at an example problem. We're being asked the solubility of carbon dioxide in pure water at 25 degrees Celsius, 0.1 atmosphere of pressure, is 0 0.0037 molar units. The common practice is to assume all of the dissolved gas is in the form of carbonic acid. What would the chemical equation for this reaction be? Dissolving carbon dioxide into water a nonmetal oxide in water in a combination reaction, nonmetal oxides in water produce an acidic solution. Combination of H2CO3, we'd call that carbonic acid. The concentration of carbonic acid is 0 0.0037 molar solution. What's the pH of our solution? and they're giving us the Ka1 value and the Ka2 value for carbonic acid. Ka1 for carbonic acid given to us is 4.3 times 10 to the negative 7th. Ka2 given to us is 5.6 times 10 to the negative 11th. What I'm noticing, the magnitude of Ka1 compared to Ka2 meets the criteria of having a difference of 10 cubed or more. In other words, the contribution of the hydrogen ion from the second ionization is so insignificant it's not worth measuring. To measure pH of this solution, we only have to remove the first of those hydrogen ions of carbonic acid. Let's begin, as we always should, by writing out the major species of our ionization. Carbonic acid H2CO3 forms a dynamic equilibrium releasing a single proton and leaving us with the bicarbonate ion HCO3-1. It's going to ionize in a stepwise fashion. Since our Ka1 constant is given to us as 4.3 times 10 to the negative 7th, this is the hydrogen that will be measured to find out the pH value. The first ionization contributes to the pH. We know the value 0 0.0037 molar of the acid. Let's call the value of hydrogen ion X and we'd have an equal quantity of the bicarbonate ion as well. We'll call that X. 
Given Ka1 as 4.3 times 10 to the negative 7th, let's set that equal to products over reactants, where the products are the two ions, each represented by the value of x, so I'll write that as x squared. Set over my 0037 molar solution of acid. When we solve for x, we'll check the 5% rule and see if our assumption was correct. We might have to go back and create an ice chart, hopefully not. We're going to cross multiply Ka1, so 4.3 E negative 7, times 0 0.0037, and the value on my calculator screen represents what we call x squared. So I'll square root my answer. And x, which we let represent hydrogen ion, is 3.99 times 10 to the negative fifth molar units. Let's quickly check the 5% rule. The equilibrium concentration of hydrogen, still on my calculator screen, divided by 0 0.0037, the initial concentration of the original acid, expressed as a percent, and my percent ionization is 1. I'll say 1.1 percent, well below 5 percent. So the 5 percent rule is being followed. We can simply do the algebra of x squared over 0037 and not need the quadratic formula. So this was just a double check to allow me to proceed to calculate pH. Of course, pH of our solution is equal to the negative log of the concentration of our hydrogen, 0 0.3, not, uh, sorry, 3.99 times 10 to the negative fifth molar units. So negative log, our H plus, negative log, the value of our hydrogen, and I find a value of pH, always report with two decimals, 4.40 pH units. Our carbonic acid that was formed when we dissolved CO2 into water created an acid. That acid ionized. The first ionization is the major contribution to the pH of our system. And we set up our ionization constant using the first Ka value. Set it equal to x squared over the original value. We checked our 5% rule, and yes, indeed, it was fine, and calculated a pH from the hydrogen ion's value. There's a second part to our problem. Let's calculate the value of carbonate, CO3 minus 2. The carbonate comes from the second removal of our proton from the bicarbonate ion up above. Now remember, HCO3, negative 1, also had a value of x. So when we solved for x, not only was it the hydrogen ion, but it was the bicarbonate ion as well. So once we know the value of x, it will become our starting point down here. In other words, the second removal from bicarbonate, when it lets go, and I'll just kind of exaggerate, it's really pointing left at this point, but it will let go of its hydrogen ion, giving us a carbonate ion, CO3 minus 2. The original value of bicarbonate came from our previous answer. It's starting at 3.99 times 10 to the negative fifth. Let's call the value of hydrogen x and the value of carbonate x and they gave us the Ka2 constant for that second removal of our proton and we set up an equilibrium expression. I'm going to set this up here because I have a little more room. Ka2 of 5.6 times 10 to the negative 11th either from our appendix D or provided here in the story problem is going to be equal to x squared targeting this, this is what we're trying to find, the carbonate x squared, because there's two equal quantities of ions, over the bicarbonate ion, which was our answer to the previous problem's x. 
cross multiply, square root, and we'll have our concentration of the remaining carbonate ion. The Ka2 value of 5.6 E negative 11 times 3.99 E negative 5. Square root our answer and we find 4.73 times 10 to the negative 8th. 4.73 times 10 to the negative 8th molar units are concentration of the carbonate. Carbonate ion is what we've been asked to solve for, CO3 minus 2. Its answer of 4.3 4.73 times 10 to the negative 8th. Ka1s determine pH of our solution. The Ka1 was used to solve for hydrogen ion and it also represented the negative bicarbonate ion. Its answer was brought over as the initial concentration in that second ionization. Friends, you now have had your lesson on weak acids in monoprotic and polyprotic form. At this point, the video lessons are assigning lesson five off of our assignment sheet. Lesson five of our assignment sheet.